thank you so much. It's such an honor for me to be here and be part of this great and wonderful uh, lecture series. And uh, I thank you all for coming out. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is about yeah, uh, randomness and uh, probability and uncertainty, and partially how it sort of comes up in everyday life in so many different facets. And then I'll also try to relate it to, uh, to a research area of randomized algorithms or Monte Carlo algorithms. So um, some of it's related to my, uh, my book that I wrote that was mentioned, Struck by Lightning, which is about probability in our everyday lives. And so you can think of you know, probability and randomness. They come up whenever we're not sure what will happen next. Right? So maybe you're on an airplane and you're not sure if the airplane is going to crash. <laughs> or maybe you're waiting for the bus and you're wondering if the bus is going to be late. Or you hear about a terrorist strike and you're wondering what the terrorists are going to do next. Or, or it's election time and you hear about a poll that's accurate 19 times out of 20. Well, what does that mean, right? <laughs> or maybe you hear about a medical study that says, we've proven that you should take this drug or you should do this exercise. And you say, well, can a medical study really prove something? Um, maybe you go to the casino, right? And you're going to gamble. And what's the probability that you're going to win and lose money and so on? Maybe there's a surprising coincidence. You run into somebody that you haven't seen in years, and what are the odds, and so on. That's all randomness. That's all uncertainty, right? So I'll try to make the point that just a bit of an understanding of what I call the, uh, the probability perspective, or how to understand probability and randomness, can go a long way towards sort of understanding things better, and sometimes, um, let's say, sometimes uh, deciding what to do a little bit better. And then, as I say, I'm also going to try to relate it to, uh, to Monte Carlo algorithms as sort of research area. So, so to start off, let me do a little. Uh, warm-up example here. So here's a survey that was conducted recently. And it asked the following kind of interesting question. It said, uh, which medium do you rely on most in order to keep abreast of the news? OK, an interesting question. And you know, multiple choice. People could say the newspaper. They could say radio. Or they could say, uh, they could say uh, television. They found that 62% of people responded to the internet. Now, first you think, wow, well, that's, what does that say? It says you know, just how important computers are in our society and how quickly things can change in a period of a few years. Well, what if I told you that the source for this survey was actually conducted on the website globeandmail.com? <laughs> <laughs> well, then you'd have a different perspective, right? And so from the point of view of a probabilist, we would say, well, that was a biased sample. They were sampling people who are already getting their news off of the internet. And if anything, it's only interesting that as few as 62% of them <laughs> considered that to be their primary method of getting the news. So, so the point of that is that even something as simple as a fact or a survey, well, there's actually randomness involved. How was the survey conducted? What can we learn from it? And so on. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of areas. Let me start off with lotteries, which was already mentioned. And Somehow I find whenever people hear, oh, I study probability, it's always, oh, let's talk about the lottery. How can I win the lottery? What are the chances I'm going to win the lottery, right? So, so you can say, well, you know, are you going to win the big jackpot? Well, I probably don't have to tell such a sophisticated audience as yourselves that the chance you're going to win the jackpot is not very high, right? <laughs> so that probably doesn't surprise you. But still, people are so fascinated. And when, you know, when my book came out and I was in the media, every time the lottery jackpots went up, I get calls and interviews from you know, television and radio stations. Let's talk about the probabilities of the lottery. Um, last year, there was actually this scandal with the so-called uh, insider wins, where you might have heard about where the retailers who were selling lottery tickets were winning a lot more of the prizes than it seemed like they should. I was actually the consulting statistician on that study. And that, to my amazement, became just huge front page news. And I was getting all these calls for interviews. So everybody's fascinated by lotteries, right? So, the probability that you'll win isn't too high, but what can we say from the point of view of a probabilist, you know, just how unlikely is it? Well, first of all, I can give you numbers, right? So I can say if you take something like the Lotto 649, well, you know, in order to win the jackpot, your six numbers chosen between 1 and 49 have to be the same as the six numbers that the lottery people choose. And the chance of that happening is about one chance in 14 million. There's 14 million different ways, or more precisely, 13,983,816. So that's not very likely. But a lot of people, somehow, they'll hear that. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, OK, but I still think I'm going to win. Right? <laughs> I, I think those, you know, the odds are pretty good. So, so I thought some about you know, how can you sort of put this in perspective? How can you say just how unlikely is that? Well, so you can make various analogies. One is you can say, well, the chance that you'll win the jackpot with a single ticket, Lotto 649, is the same as the chance, if you choose an adult Canadian woman at random, that she will give birth to a baby within the next minute and a half. 
pretty, pretty unlikely, right? Or if you have to drive to the store to buy that lottery ticket, you're about twice as likely to be killed in an automobile accident going to the store <laughs> as you are to win the jackpot. Or if you buy a ticket once a week, on average you'll win the jackpot about once every 270,000 years. <laughs> so just not very likely, right? Now, so from my point of view, that means, you know, the chance you're going to win the jackpot is just so small, you just shouldn't even think about it. Now, of course, some people might enjoy or have fun playing lottery and the excitement and the dreaming, and that's fine, of course, but you know, if you really think, oh yeah, I think I'm going to win the lottery, well, you're just not, right? It's just so unlikely. So, so when I put it that way, people think, boy, I'm being a real uh, killjoy, right? <laughs> you know, everyone, everyone was having fun playing the lottery, and now I said it's so unlikely. But the reason I use that as an example is because not only is it very unlikely that you're going to win the lottery jackpot, but lots of other things, some of which are pretty bad, are also very unlikely. So there's sort of a flip side, and let me uh, move on to that. So, you know, on the other hand, many bad things are also very unlikely. So let me just mention a few things. So one I'll talk briefly about is uh, airplane crashes. And let me begin with a personal story, which is back when I was a graduate student, I was scheduled to fly to New York City to John F. Kennedy Airport to visit relatives. And exactly one week before my scheduled flight, there was a big plane crash at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City. And 73 people died. And my first reaction, probably like a lot of people's first reaction, was, gosh, you know, I can't fly to this airport now. You know, I have to cancel my trip, or maybe I can take the train, or you know, walk to New York City. But you know, I'm, I'm not going to fly to New York City after, after this, uh, this accident's taken place. And then I said, well, wait a minute. At the time, I was a graduate student studying uh, probability theory. Maybe I could be uh, a little bit more sensible about this. And that's really the point, is how can we be sensible about randomness and probabilities? So what did I think? Well, the first thing is, you know, the old cliche is actually true that uh, airplane travel, especially commercial airplane travel, is actually very safe. And only about one commercial airplane flight in five million has a serious accident, an accident which involves fatalities. So in other words, if you get on a commercial airplane, you're really quite safe as far as a serious accident. Um, if you want to worry about something, worry about being late. Because <laughs> about 27% of commercial flights are actually more than 15 minutes late. So that's a smart thing to worry about, right? But as far as being killed, it's really unlikely. But then you can say, well, OK, that's general fancy statistics. But this is a particular airport, right? This is John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City. Well, I looked it up, and there's actually over 5,000 flights a week just into this one airport, John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City. So what that means is even if I knew for sure that there was going to be another major accident at this airport within the next week, there would still only be about one chance in 5,000 that it would be my flight. Now that's not so small, but it's still quite small. So that's another way to think about it. But a third way to think about it is to say, well, you know, this, this crash, it wasn't the fault of the airport, it seemed. So in other words, the airport wasn't to blame. So whether my flight was going to crash was actually what we call statistically independent of whether this other flight crashed. And um, we can't really, you know, just because that flight crashed didn't make it any more or less likely that my flight would crash. And when you think of it that way, it's a little bit like that old joke about the guy who was worried that somebody might bring a bomb onto his airplane. So his solution was to always bring his own bomb onto the airplane. Because <laughs> he figured the chance of two different bombs on the same airplane was just, <laughs> just astronomically unlikely, so he was safe. So. Now, of course, in that case, whether he had a bomb and whether the bad guy had a bomb were independent, right? Neither one had any effect on the other. And the same with me in this other fight. So for all those reasons, I said, wait a minute, I'm being silly. It's OK to fly to New York City. And I did, and everything was fine. Um, I used this example when I was uh, being interviewed on the radio once. And uh, the radio announcer said, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's great. You've got all these you know, fancy statistics, right? But, but does that really help when you know, you're up in the sky, and there's a little turbulence, and you get nervous, and so on? And it's a fair question. And my answer is yes, it does help if you really stop and think about how unlikely these things are. So if it's just in one here and out the other, it's not going to help. But if you really stop and think about it, you realize that just like I'm not going to win the lottery, the airplane's not going to crash. So you realize these things are so unlikely that it really can't affect things. And in my case, I actually used to be kind of a nervous traveler, right? I, whenever there was a little turbulence, I'd be looking out the window to see if the wing was still attached properly and you know, all that kind of stuff. And now I'm actually not. I say, no, it's extremely unlikely there's going to be a problem. So, OK, so then you say, well, that's uh, airplane crashes. Let me mention a few other things. One is, let me mention briefly the uh, terrorism issue. So that's something that comes up a lot. And of course, uh, it's a very serious issue that people think about. 
And in particular, after, let's say, the 9 11 uh, terrorist attacks, well, you know, it had a huge effect on people's psyches, right? I say, you know, sales of anxiety medications went way up, and people were very fearful. And uh, a number of couples, including one that I know personally, they decided they better get married now while they could, right? So <laughs> there, was, there was a real feeling that, you know, everything had really changed and so on. So what can we say about that from a probability point of view? Well, obviously, you know, the 9 11 attacks were a horrendous event by any uh, uh, stretch of the imagination. And that's for sure. But then we can say, well, as far as how does it affect our lives, well, here's one thing that kind of puts it in perspective, at least for me, a sort of a perspective, and that's that in the month of uh, September 2001, the month of the 9-11 attacks, more Americans were killed that month in ordinary automobile accidents than were killed in the 9-11 attack. Now, what does that mean? I mean, it certainly doesn't mean anything from a moral point of view. We can't equate these things at all. But if we think from the point of view of, you know, I'm a random person in North America, what's the chance that I'm going to be killed? Well, the probabilities didn't change that much because of 9-11, right? It was just something that was comparable. It was less than one month of automobile accidents. Now, again, it's not to in any way minimize it, but it is to say that, you know, this whole anxiety medication and we've got to get married now and so on maybe wasn't in keeping with the real probabilities.